Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for a special edition of the State of Cybercrime with our Senior Director of Incident Response and Cloud Operations, Matt Radilak. He is joined by David Gibson, Senior VP of Strategic Programs, and Devere Sesson, Security Research Manager here at Veronis. So without any further ado, I present Matt, David, and Devere. How's it going, guys? Hey, Frank. Thank you. Hi, How's Frank. How's it going, Matt? Hey, Frank. Hey, Good, morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, thanks for getting things kicked off for us, Frank. Uh, we're going to dive right into it in the interest of time. First thing that I wanted to cover really is just a brief synopsis of why we're here. It's our responsibility uh, at Veronis to help customers and the world protect their data from attack. There is an increased likelihood of an attack right now, both by cyber criminals and state-sponsored actors. But at the same time, there is a humanitarian crisis going on. So we do ask for everyone, again, to repeat what Frank said, to just be civil and respectful in the chat. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. First and foremost, we're going to cover a brief history of uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks. We're going to give our prediction on the state of cooperation and whether or not we'll see continued cooperation between U.S. and foreign intelligence. We'll also give an overview of several uh, known Russian threat actors, uh, and that's going to be a spotlight from my colleague Devere, our security research manager. And then we're all going to talk a little bit about tips and tricks and some mitigations and things that you can do to prepare for increased time of cyber operations. So let's start out by, by really you know, talking about, is there a history, has there been a past, have state-sponsored cyber attacks happened before? I think that we all know the answer to that question. Uh, and that's yes. In fact, most recently, there was an attack just back in, in February, just a few days ago, almost four days ago, on a German windmill farm that left the windmills unable to be remote controlled. And cyber attacks on critical infrastructure on a new thing. Um, there are a few other notable ones from recent years that we want to share with you. Who remembers almost about a year ago today, uh, on February, uh, I think it was right around February 24th of last year, we saw an attack in Oldsmar, Florida, on the Florida water supply. Specifically, what the attackers did was adjusted the levels of sodium hydroxide that was in the water, increasing the parts per million by orders of magnitude. Just another example of how cyber attacks can interrupt your day-to-day -day life. Now, if we go back even a few years farther, there were some Russian threat actors that leveraged a lot of different cyber attacks in order to disrupt day-to-day -day life in both Crimea and the Ukraine. Back in 2014, we saw interference in the elections process both in Ukraine and in Crimea. And then in 2015, in late December, the, these threat actors used to actually shut off the power grid, kill emergency phone lines, even taking attacks on power distribution and backup channels. And then just a year later, that happened again, except that cyber attack was focused on Kyiv in Ukraine, shutting off the heat and the power. And these are just a few of the examples reaching back through time of notable state-sponsored cyber attacks. But that isn't what the focus of today's presentation is. What we really want to talk about is really what are some things that you should expect and not expect, as well as like, let's go over some of the actors, exploits, and mitigations that you might encounter. I think the first thing is not to expect clear attribution. A lot of times we're asked, you know, when doing investigations, well, who is responsible for this? And unless you're dealing with a cyber criminal that outright tells you who they are, it can be really difficult to figure out who is behind a particular attack. And if you focus too much of your efforts on that, you might miss key details of the incident that's unfolding before you. In addition to that, expect new and novel zero days. As I think back to the zero days that we've combated over time, some ones that stick out are things like log four shell and proxy log on and sunburst. And these are typically in the toolkits of state sponsored actors. So you might have to look out for things that no one knows about yet. Also, definitely expect to see cobalt strike beacons pop up inside of your environment, as well as look for new and novel or exploitative usage of PowerShell. 
as always, and I think we probably mentioned this on every webinar talking about cybercrime or state-sponsored actors, spear phishing is still the main initial access vector used by attackers to get initial footholds inside of an organization. The other thing that you should do is expect attacks on third-party providers. This is one of the known toolkits used by state-sponsored actors, most recently as of last year when we saw the attack on the managed security service provider. In addition to that, if you haven't done any hunting on the dark web, and this is something that my colleague Devere is incredibly passionate about, in just a few clicks, you can find credentials and RDP access being sold online and not even for large sums of money. So it's possible that your organization could already be compromised and it's important to look for and find the unknowns. Now, Devere, you wanted to share a few other things about this as well, right? Yeah, Matt, thank you very much. So uh, as we can see from the Conti leak from August about the playbooks, uh, Conti, for example, as, as a crime organization, uses well-documented methods in order to attack organizations. And in that screenshot, uh, they actually uh, um, direct the, the controllers, so to speak, uh, or the ransomware operators, what to look for, what types of attacks to execute, what types of scripts to execute in order to get uh, access to either other accounts or to perform lateral movements. In, and in that type of example, you can see that they are utilizing uh, SMB or the brute uh, type of script in order to use a password list in order to brute force all sorts of an account, all sorts of accounts within that organization. And in that, uh, uh, in, the, in the lines below, you can see what a successful signing actually looks like, either uh, for an administrator or uh, other Cisco user in that example. In addition, as part of actually turning off security controls within the endpoint after becoming, uh, after elevating themselves to local administrators, they are trying to uh, either using either use registry in order to turn off uh, Defender in that example, or again relying on PowerShell. And these scripts are known and, and, and the commands are quite known. And one, it's one, it's really easy to find and, and to hunt for. And B, it's, uh, the commands are actually stating very clearly what it's actually doing. And for example, disabling anti-spyware or disabling the antivirus mechanism of Defender, et cetera. In addition, we can see that credentials are being sold online by threat actors in platforms which are very easy to, to use as any other retail site wherever. And these accesses are defined by the type of IP or the price per account being sold. And threat actors are, can actually add it to the cart by as many credentials as they want or accesses as they want in order to gain access to the organization in order to uh, deploy their own uh, malwares or ransomwares, et cetera. And when it comes to uh, crime groups, um, when talking about the potential revenue involved, this is just, this is nothing when compared to the potential uh, income that could be used with ransomware. And if they can buy financial access for $10 an account, that is nothing for against the potential income. Now, one question that's come in so far, Devere, and if we want to take this later, it's totally okay. But mm -hmm. someone was asking, what are Cobalt Strike Beacons? Could, I mean, I'm familiar with them from a command and control perspective and as a way to operate a large amount of infections, but maybe you could share with our audience any, anything else you want to add. Absolutely. So Cobalt Strike was a framework uh, being developed for the usage of security organizations or uh, intelligence organizations within the U.S. And in order to get a license for that, an organization has to be vetted for that. And it allows for the command and control for uh, C2 agents, which are very sophisticated and has a lot of different capabilities to, uh, to a centralized server. And the control could be rotated to other servers and it's considered as one of the top tools being used today by threat actors because it's being used as a commodity. So some versions has actually got leaked by other organizations and whatnot. And this is the actually uh, most common tool set 
within the usage of threat actors. So a professionally um, developed command and control infrastructure being used by everyday cyber criminals. Exactly. It's like giving uh, a, a, a massive tool for, um, for criminals, exactly. Yeah, thanks. So um, in, in addition, I, I know you mentioned this already, j- just to show everybody, I mean, it is this simple to be able to not just buy credentials, but also, uh, you know, remote desktop access potentially into different environments or nodes inside of different cloud compute. And and again, this, this is just how an infection or a cyber attack might get started. And these are a lot of the tools that are used by cyber criminals, but we would expect to also be leveraged by state sponsored actors as oftentimes the, the easy way to get in is someone that's already in and is giving you that initial foothold. Exactly. So in some cases, someone from within the organization who already has an access to a privileged account or anything else is actually selling this account and uh, later on uh, gets some of the revenue involved with the ransomware operators. In other cases, the initial access could be part of a brute force attack or speed fishing campaign, but we'll get to that. Um, But as you can see, the prices are very low per account. And as you mentioned, in cloud environments, uh, the potential revenue is quite higher because threat actors could actually use miners or take control of other cloud environment machines in order to further uh, take control of the potential organization and, and whatnot. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Now, um, one one of the questions that I got asked a lot by uh, customers last week who were reaching in and really uh, looking for advice on how to handle the evolving uh, cyber operations was just around whether or not we expected collaboration to continue between U.S. intelligence and Russian intelligence in order to take down cyber criminals. Now, for those of you that missed um, our last uh, episode of the state of cybercrime, we talked about how uh, U.S. and Russian intelligence collaborated in order to take down our evil or revil threat actors. And this is something that we predict would be suspended right now. In addition to that, we, we predict with that suspension that cyber criminals will use that opportunity to perhaps, you know, enhance their operations. And and our day-to-day caseload would reflect that. We're seeing more attacks on organizations, both domestically and abroad, notably in Europe, related to just the increase in cybercrime, because a lot of people have their attention focused somewhere else. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about those different uh, cybercrime organizations, those different threat actors. I I know, Devere, you were really passionate and excited to to share with our audience some of your findings from the the research that you and your team have done into all this activity so far this year and really, you know, since you joined Veronis. Yeah, so um, one of the key things that we found about uh, already um, mentioned or reported type of ransomware attacks is that uh, from, from the slide that we can see, Conti is the most uh, known or reported type of group that was able to extort uh, throughout 2021, the most uh, num- the highest number of organizations. And in December alone, Lockbit, in December 2021 alone, Lockbit was quite high and staggering with the numbers, with the numbers of the organizations it compromised. Conti, is basically one of the most prolific groups uh, for, for the past few years uh, because it's the same group changing and evolving. And it was also known as Gentrab. And uh, this group is, uh, is very methodical, is very, has the, the documentation needed to execute its goals and objectives as we've seen earlier. And um, we, for the past few days, we, we saw that uh, It actually, the group itself took a stand uh, with the Kremlin uh, against the West. Now, when it comes to the statement they actually released, they say they are 100% support the Kremlin. And if someone tries to threaten Russia or the Kremlin, they will take matters to their own hands. Now, this is quite a statement from a crime group. And it actually shows us that it either has ties with all sorts of organizations within the government, but it's actually, this is the first case of a group that actually, crime group that takes a stand uh, against the West. Now, from the statistics that we had previously on VT, we saw that uh, Grand Grab or, or Conti are the highest number of payloads that actually got sent and uploaded to VT, to Virostop. In this uh, um, 
And this message that got released today, uh, it was released by an Ukrainian member within the Conti group, which as again, took a stand against the West, which said that he's releasing a lot of documents from within the group, a lot of communications, internal communications about it. And it's quite interesting from what we saw, um, it was containing a lot of internal email addresses. And you can see that the group is quite large. All these dots that you see on your screen are in fact Conti members or affiliates that were communicating with each other from within the Jabber uh, server. And on top of that, you could see that the email addresses being used are quite interesting. And it's mentioning Conti at Yandex.ru, Networker, which is another type of crime group, RDP Corp, Where Is My Money, Admin at Expiro Team, and Black Matter Interviews. So for example, Black Matter is another crime organization that got dis disbanded and, and was absorbed by other groups as well. So we are talking about a lot of crime groups that are actually looking for to make a lot of money from ransomware attacks, extortions, double extortions, and even triple extortions. Can I cut in here for a second, Devere? Sure thing. One of the things I wanted to revisit was when we look at this spider web of connections between uh, various different uh, cyber criminal entities, I think oftentimes you will think that it's like a group of people in a room somewhere that are doing something. And I think one of the takeaways here is really to think about how these are large global networks, large organizations, you know, potentially with hundreds of difference of individual members and contributors and affiliates. And it isn't just like one or or two people who might make headlines when arrests happen, but a much larger network of criminals. Absolutely. They are not operating from any basement. They are very methodical and very well organized. And some of these cyber criminals, they're not taking a stand one way or the other, it seems like, right? Exactly. So if you remember Lockbit from a few slides ago, which was one of the most prolific groups in December 2021, they're actually saying that business is above everything. Uh, for them, it's business as usual, and they are not taking a stand at all. Now, um, kind of moving away from talking specifically about um, all the different cyber criminal organizations, and especially the more notable ones, let, let's shift gears a little bit towards state-sponsored actors. You know, and, and what do you have to share? For, first thing is, I, I do think we should shout out uh, Mandiant for putting together this really awesome and interesting infographic, a great way to highlight all the different threat actor groups that are known to be state-sponsored. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we're looking at on the screen? Absolutely. So um, for the past few years, there have been several state-sponsored uh, groups that have been referred as bears. So we have the cozy bear, the fancy bear, and the primitive bear. And they are all comprised of all sorts of units with their own objectives, sets of goals and methods in order to, to gain these objectives. Now, uh, the government organ organizations that hold these units are the FSB, which is the equivalent of the FBI, the SVR, which is the equivalent of the CIA, and the GRU, which is some kind of an NSA. And each of these organizations has their own goals. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see that the FSB, which is, so to speak, domestic or federal organization, actually deploys and, and, and utilize these sort of units in order to gain uh, objectives on external entities from outside of the country. No, we still, we still have these questions going around, but for example, the GRU is much more interested in, in, in data and, and data. First of all, everyone is interested with data, but the GRU is much more in, interested in aerospace and defense type of information, while um, it, it has another unit which is performing all sorts of destructive actions, as we'll see in, in the coming, in coming slides. The SVR and the FSB are much more reliant on getting information in general without destructing. So when we're talking about the actual three bears, we're talking about first with uh, the Cozy Bear. Cozy Bear is uh, a name for a set, set of several units and groups within it that is actually part of the GRU, the, mi the military intelligence. This is the most destructive threat group uh, linked to a state sponsored. And uh, it has all sorts of names, Nobelium or UNC 2452, which UNC means 
an unknown cluster of other groups. We know that uh, based on the findings and reports already released, it has been working with the GRU unit and believes active since uh, 2009. And it has some interesting uh, history when it comes to the actions it has been taking for the past few years. So, um, for example, it has been uh, responsible to all sorts of incidents around the world, mainly about um, campaigns that target uh, industrial electron ele electric systems, such as black energy and uh, industrial. So it has been affecting the Ukrainian electricity supply for uh, since 2015. In 2017, when uh, the equation group, which is part of the NSA uh, exploits got leaked. Uh, and if you remember WannaCry and, and all the other exploits that uh, were released with Eternal Blue and Eternal Romance, uh, some people believe that it was in charge of developing NatPetya. And NatPetya is another type of ransomware which was using the NSA's exploits. And it's kind of interesting to see how an exploit that was developed by a, a US agency was later utilized in order to infect machines and, and encrypt machines all around the world um, just for money. Um, other than that, it has been targeting the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic in South Korea as part of, again, deploying a, a malicious malware that affected machines and uh, caused quite an impact. Um, and for example, the French presidential campaign, they actually targeted specifically Macaron in 2017. So this group has, is quite notorious for destructive actions and targeting uh, um, quite well-known and high-value high targets all around the world. So when what comes, does like a typical attack look like from Cozy Bear? Sure. So when it comes to the uh, attack flow or the actual steps they're taking, it all starts with recon, understanding who your target is, trying to scan them using all sorts of methodologies for vulnerabilities and publicly accessible exploits in order to take action against, to gain that initial foothold, that foot in the door in, a, in order to control machines. When it comes to uh, weaponizations, it's all the same when talking about um, the payloads itself. So it can be used as a weaponized office docs, such as macros or sending a malicious document. Hey, uh, this is a formal document that you need to sign or something very urgent. And uh, it contains the actual malicious payload that creates the impact on that machine, on that target. Other than that, we're also looking at watering hole attacks. So if you remember MageCart, the attack that allowed threat actors to gain uh, credential, uh, uh, credit card information from sites which were not attacked, it's called a watering hole attack. It's basically a, a, a type of attack that targets third parties of organizations changing all sorts of code or, or libraries in order to insert their own malicious code that will be passed on that site that uses that, that code. So um, libraries are another part of it when using your code or using or relying on third parties, they could be targeted as part of the attack, which the organization is actually being targeted as the main target. Um, the delivery is still the same, spear phishing. Spear phishing from a known third party that your business is working with. And um, the, it, it, the, the main goal is to send emails from a known sender in order to avoid detection from all sorts of blocking mechanism. Because if someone will try to send out a, a spam or any malicious email from an unknown sender, it will be immediately blocked, right? So while taking over a third party and sending emails on their behalf to your business, it's much more easier to, for, to making the attack act to actually happen. When it comes to the exploitation, um, uh, Cozy Bear has been known for all sorts of zero days uh, vulnerabilities, such as utilizing the eternal romance with not Petya in the past or using any common vulnerabilities in the daily operation. And in order to gain that persistence and in order to con continue in control that organization, they use 
all sorts of malicious firmwares, uh, such as um, even images or, or um, network software that could be installed on all sorts of network devices uh, in order to control that organization from a device which is not properly monitored. So it's kind of a weird one. Uh, it, they are talking about, we're talking about a, a package called Cyclops Blink, which is uh, the new iteration for a package called VPN Filter. And it's quite an interesting one. They're developing uh, variants, Linux variants, in order to use that on network devices, which are completely not part of the Windows uh, servers or your other organizational type of asset. So that probably uh, means that they don't have all the same protections that like a application server or like a, a endpoint or a file server might have, right? These are probably hardware devices that potentially have no, um, you know, uh, oversight similar to other devices in a network, right? Exactly. So it's very hard to monitor a network device, which is considered as an appliance when it comes to uh, uh, security issues or security activities going on. Uh, since we don't have any type of ADRs or anything like that, like you just mentioned, uh, application servers and whatnot. Um, when it comes to command and control, when it comes to actually maintaining control with the victim, they are using VPS hosts from all around the world. Uh, not necessarily, if you see an IP coming from Russia, doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's Russian and, and goes the other way around. If you see a, a, a weird communication coming on from the US, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's American. And they have been using servers from all around the world just to mask their identity and their connections, uh, which at the end, the main objective is to gain credentials, is to gain as much information as possible about that state, about that victim. As we mentioned, uh, they are targeting aerospace industries. For example, uh, they may be looking for, to have the extra edge when it comes to uh, aerospace type of rep weapons and whatnot. And at the end, as, as the main goal is to uh, cause havoc, is to impact, as we've seen with the Kiev uh, uh, power outages back in 2015. So, um, you know, shifting gears from Cozy Bear to another threat actor, talk to us a little bit about uh, Primitive Bear. So Primitive Bear is the group that is being the, uh, used and, and um uh, being controlled, not controlled, but being used by the FSB, uh, the equivalent of the FBI. And this is, again, the same question. Why does the uh, internal federal services want to, wants to perform all sorts of cyber attacks? Um, and it's quite an interesting one. Um, they're believed to be active since 2013, and they have been targeting Ukrainian organizations and governments. We haven't seen them targeting any other countries. Uh, for that sort of sort of matter, uh, but still, um, and the kill chain is quite interesting. Um, they have been again trying to perform all sorts of recon, trying to use weaponized office docs, and and it's the same all over again: spear phishing, weaponized malware docs, uh, um, um, macros. And again, the same exploitations of zero days and common exploits, uh, known and unknown vulnerabilities. And um, they have a different type of persistency and trying to keep that foot in the door, trying to keep that cover channel. So they either use a custom malware or a type of payload, and they could also use Cobra Strike for that, for that matter. So it really depends on who is the victim, who is the actual target, what they're up to. Is there data destructor, destruction? Is it data theft? Is it persistency and whatnot? And for that matter, they've been also using schedule tasks, which is super easy to gain persistency with that. You just set a schedule task to execute your uh, C2 agent, your malicious C2 agent, every time your machine restarts, and that's it. It just starts automatically when you restart your machine. On, on top of that, they have been also using uh, VNC clients for is remote access. Yeah. And when we, you mentioned on command and control Dyn DNS, so it's maybe, maybe some of our audience members don't know, know what that is. Could, could you maybe talk about Dyn DNS? So dynamic DNS allows threat actors to potentially rotate their IPs once in every few minutes 
or every few hours in order to um, maintain and point control into that domain while changing and shifting servers one after the, the other. So for example, if right now uh, uh, a malicious domain is malicious.com and its IP is something something, in the next hour it will be completely something else in order to avoid detection and avoid any uh, blocking of the malicious IPs being used. But the domain is still the same. So they're taking steps in order to try to avoid um, you know, getting caught and getting blocked quickly. Exactly. Now, are- um, in the spirit mm-hmm. of bears, Devere, um, I think you have another bear to tell us about. Yeah, uh, this bear is, in fact, Fancy Bear, uh, which is being uh, used by the GRU. And uh, the GRU has been using this, this group since 24, 20, 2004. It's, it's really early. Um, again, it's targeting aerospace, defense, energy, government, amongst others. And it has been targeting all sorts of countries all across the world, uh, not necessarily Eastern Europe and whatnot. It has different names. So it could be Snake Mackerel, Swallowtail, Group 74, uh, Pond Storm, and others. And um, when we're talking about the attacks themselves, so if you remember the, the um, Hillary Clinton breach back in 2016, uh, they are, sorry for that, they are um, believed to be uh, behind this attack uh, in 2016 with the emails and, and whatnot. Um, they have been also uh, known for the 2015 against the German bond stack and et cetera. When it comes to the TTPs and the kill chain itself, we can see the same type of activities uh, with a different, uh, with the different changes with, with some uh, few steps. So it's the same OSINT, it's the same weaponized documents. It's the same watering hole as we mentioned same exploitation and fish, at phishing attempts and phishing pages, et cetera. Um, one thing that is kind of a different is the custom malwares and off the shelf uh, type of tools being used and the, the command and control. And they use something called DGA. Now DGA is very interesting and it, it requires a deep, uh, some, high, some high skills in order to develop. It's not easy to develop. The DGA is uh, a unique and generated subdomain being used as part of the command and control. So for example, we have uh, a known malicious domain, which is malicious.com. The potential DGA subdomain could be a generated set of keystroke uh, dot malicious.com. And that DGA is constantly shifting and changing. And they basically listen to all the subdomains in that domain in order to uh, actually catch certain connections coming to that domain or subdomain. Um, VPS servers are the same, trying to use all sorts of servers from around the world, mainly by paying uh, cryptocurrencies or using all sorts of uh, funny domains names in order to uh, avoid detection. Now, in, in the past, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, these different obfuscation techniques by attackers in order to avoid detection. We, we've also talked a lot about, um, about open source intelligence. And, and that was one theme that I saw throughout each one of these different attacker overviews. For some of our audience members that are a little bit new to that space, Devere, could you talk a little bit about both how attackers and defenders use open source intelligence? Absolutely. So... Open source intelligence is basically uh, everything related to uh, easily gathered information from within the web. We're talking about uh, registered domains and linked uh, IPs to that domain, potential subdomains in that domain, what type of certificates are being used, when does this domain has been registered, uh, who's the actual person, who's the registrant behind the domain. So for example, one of the quickest and easy ways to gain information about uh, the IT of an organization is to check the who is information of that domain. You will see the full address or full name of that person and it's very easy, easy to target. Also, for example, checking on LinkedIn, who are the potential employees working in that organization, crossing that first name, last name, and trying to understand the potential convention of the email addresses to easily target them uh, later on. And it goes 
on and on and on. I think one that we've seen a lot, especially in spear phishing attacks that are successful, there, there's some, um, you know, uh, we're going to talk in a moment about mitigations. And one of those mitigations is multi-factor authentication, but that's not a panacea either, because for some people, the answers to their security questions are very easy to find out. Like, what was the name of your first pet? What street did you grow up on? What school did you go to? These kind of things are also sometimes easy to find out because of open source intelligence, right? Exactly. So it's very easy to gain information about a person, about uh, that target that this threat actor was trying to target. It could be either the, the CFO, or it could be the, the office manager or the CEO. And while trying to target them, they are using all sorts of techniques in order to gain information about that person, about personal information, personal details, such as the, the date of birth. They could just go on and use Facebook for that matter and to check the personal information of that person. And they could try and understand who are his uh, co-workers or acquaintances in order to gain information about, uh, like you just mentioned, uh, grandma's na name or his mother's uh, maiden name and et cetera. And it goes on and on. These are just a few examples. Now, let, let's shift gears a little bit and, and let's talk about um, some of those mitigations. Um, the first one that I really want to talk about, and, and both Devere and I are incredibly passionate about this topic, is uh, what we call assume breach, right? And so exactly. if everyone on this call for just a moment could just, you know, almost close your eyes and think for a second, what would you do if you expected and thought that right now an attacker is already inside of your environment, but your defenses have missed them? right? Maybe it's another zero day that is in a popular appliance or third-party software. Maybe it's uh, you know, a widespread phishing campaign. Have you thought about what it might have to do if you don't detect that initial breach? Have you thought about what your plan might be? And have you actually prepared and maybe even simulated that plan for eradication and recovery? And so what we mean by that is it's not so simple to just say, like, when you find the attackers, you can just turn them off or kick them out. Um, sometimes you have to do a lot of very deliberate efforts. One of the things that always comes to mind for me that I'm always trying to coach clients about is having uh, some experience mitigating a golden ticket and having rotated those KRB, TGT service account passwords and really what the impact on your business can be to having done that. Um, the other thing that's really important is, is this is really where behavioral analytics as a category can be really helpful, right? When you're thinking about all the different ways that you might identify a threat, you have to be very deliberate about how you identify the unknown. And so we always recommend augmenting signature-based detection with behavioral-based detection. Yes, that's very accurate. Uh, we can't take anything for granted if we see a potential successfully sign-in coming from a known employee from a certain location, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's legitimate. It could be malicious as well. So, you know, um, and, and, and enforcing MFA, that's obvious. But when you say everywhere you can, what do you mean by that? So I'll basically start to map my entire corporate applications or services uh, that are, are being used daily and check out if it's possible to either set up another method as, as we are all aware, you know, something you know, something you are and something uh, uh, you have. And we need to try and add another method for authentication. It could be an external device, a physical device. It could be an, an authenticator application on your phone. It could be a text message. And it's really imperative to uh, map it all out uh, take nothing for granted, seriously perform an asset discovery inside and outside on your DMZ, on your uh, uh, outskirts of your organization, uh, all the way to your uh, um, collaboration applications. It's one of the key uh, methods in order to uh, stop threat actors at the door, making sure they're not being able to, to sign in. We've also seen... Uh some instances where people uh, had MFA as optional, but didn't under, didn't realize that too. So enforcing it, you know, where you can, obviously is a little bit deeper than just making sure that, that it's enabled. Exactly. It needs to be enforced. 
Um, one of the, and, and I actually just did a, a, another co-hosted presentation around this topic very specifically is, you know, this is a good opportunity to really evaluate and potentially increase the verbosity of your logs. Um, and so what I mean by that, these are, these are just a kind of couple of really common examples of when we're doing investigations, these logs are missing. Um, now, and this is an effort we always go through with our customers to make sure we have all these logs. Um, but, but just to share it, share it with this, the whole audience here, one is failure events. Oftentimes it's seen that, well, if the attacker or the, the user wasn't successful, why, why do I want to capture that? Well, you might not be able to identify something as under attack if you're not pulling in the things that were unsuccessful. Another really critical one is what's called advanced NTLM auditing. This is where you can grab additional information around the actual source device of an NTLM authentication, which is going to be really, really important, especially if you are running any Windows computers in your domain, which is probably a majority of the people um, that are on this bridge today. Uh, another one to keep in mind is, is actually your PowerShell logs. Now there's a number of different types of logs that you can grab for PowerShell up into and including the actual scripts and commands that were used. And right now when you're at a time where you might expect you know, a threat actor to use PowerShell against you, this would be a, another great time to increase the robustity and consider storing those logs if it's not something that you're gathering today. Uh, the last one, and then I'll toss it over to Devere in case there's anything that you want to add, is the logs from your SaaS applications. Oftentimes it's seen that when an attack happens that, you know, the only thing the attacker is after is like the drive on that endpoint and the credentials that are in memory. Um, but what's often a foregone conclusion is how easy when you have remote control over a device that it is to actually log in and impersonate that user in various different SaaS applications. And so being able to know what they touched and where and where they logged in, even through things like identity identity providers, database or infrastructure-based SaaS applications. These are good and important events to have at your fingertips should you need to do an investigation or even just potentially you're, you're, you know, you're taking those events and you're searching for known behaviors or even doing a little bit of threat hunting on top of that. Yeah, uh, one more point that I want to address to you is sometimes organizations don't talk about lack of storage when it comes to uh, log and log retention and how do they keep the logs um, I think one of the key considerations is um, we need to understand that um, if there is a limit, if there's a budget constraint for storage, I think it's, it's outweighing, outweighing the potential impact of a potential ransomware attack, which could be avoided if you could have as many logs as possible with that storage uh, uh, capacity increase and whatnot. So it's imperative to, to log everything as much as possible. And one of the tips I generally give clients is when you think about, you know, how long to keep logs for, the, the longer that potentially, you know, maybe the longer in time, the slower the disk, or maybe even moving it to an archive so that if you do need to call on it, yeah, it might take a little bit of time, but it's not gone. Sometimes our investigations reach back years. Uh, in fact, a client we were recently working with had an investigation where we went back three years in time uh, worth of events through various different archives in order to piece together the storyline of what happened. Now, um, the, the other thing, and this is kind of shifting gears a little bit from typical cyber operations is really kind of taking a step back and examining uh, and evaluating your business continuity and your continuity of operations plans. Um, some of the things that we like to go through and really talk about are things like communications. What if you couldn't send an email to someone? Do you know how you would get in touch with them? What if you wouldn't able to use Teams chat? Do you know how you would get in touch with them? Do you have a, a phone tree, for instance, that everyone has a copy of so they could leverage phone calls? Um, what about the instances where, you know, and we talked about this earlier with the attacks on the windmills that were, you know, they lost the ability to be remote controlled. Do you have a plan in place if you need physical access to your servers and your infrastructure? There was a popular, uh, I think we would call it an IT uh, user error. Right, might be the right way to, to word it, Devere, where some, some uh, default routing was changed. And the only way to recover that routing and restore that application was to actually send engineers into a data center and actually physically log into servers to make changes. The other thing to consider, you know, is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, with an increase in activity is potentially increasing, you know, the resources that you apply to monitoring. So how can you, you maybe get a little bit more out of what you have or supplement what you're doing with third parties in order to have extra eyes onto what's going on? Yeah. So it's, for example, in one of the cases that we all heard a couple of months ago, 
uh, it was impossible for a specific company to uh, gain access remotely to the data centers or the servers uh, due to a routing issue and deployment. And they physically had to go to the data centers and manually type everything down and change the configurations. And it took them a lot of time and a lot of money just to get that thing going. Um, when it comes to longer shifts, remember that your security teams are working day and night in order to protect the, the organization and you need to protect them too. Uh, they are the weakling and, and they start suddenly coming to a point in which they are sometimes fatigued or getting to that alert fatigue type of uh, situation where they are bombarded with alerts coming in and they're just not aware of anything going on. So try to see and, and, and check how to increase your staff and how to retain your people. Uh, it's very important. Uh, on top of that, uh, MDM and the type of asset control is quite a significant one. You need to be able to access every type of asset uh, at any given moment and at any case, including uh, the peripheral type of devices, such as laptops, such as uh, VMs, cloud instances, everything at every given moment, uh, just in the case of someone breaking in and trying to uh, perform some impact trying to uh, uh, ex exploit your servers or detonate some malware. Yeah, thanks. And I, I think the other thing I, I just want to mention to everyone is, um, you know, this is just the first time that you're hearing from us about this uh, particular topic and in current events. Uh, stay tuned, you know, uh, as long as you signed up for today's webinar, you'll be able to get notifications from us about releases of uh, different threats and vulnerabilities that might be identified by Devere and the other members of the Threat Labs team, uh, upcoming webinars, or even, uh, you know, tips and tricks and even investigative best practices that you can hear about um, from Veronis. So um, next, what I want to do is, you know, we're going to uh, take a second and we're going to take a look at all the questions that have come in uh, so far throughout the webinar. But the other thing that we're going to do, we're just going to ask if you guys wouldn't mind filling out a short poll about today's uh, webinar session uh, while we do that Q&A. Uh, and let's let's scan through uh, some of the questions here. One, one of the things that came in, Devere, and I'll, I'll ask this one to you, was, is there a recommended way to search the dark web and the deep net for leaked credentials? Um, we really want to know if our organization has had some data leaked on the dark web. Um, potentially, yes. Uh, going through and sifting through the entire dark web is not an easy task, but I highly recommend on utilizing Have I Been Pwned, they have a specific feature that alerts your domain, your organization, whether certain credentials has been detected or got leaked uh, just uh, for making sure that you are well connected to that and you get the alerts coming in from them. And it's quite uh, a very neat feature. It's free that they use in order to inform organizations. So, um, and I'm gonna group a couple of these questions together and, and I'll take this one first as well, Devere, and then maybe you can add on. Um, is, there, is there anything that we know about who are the current targets of uh, Russian threat actors and, um, or you know, this increase in cyber criminal activity? So, so far, what we've seen from the Russian threat actors has been specifically targeting uh, UK government, or not UK, excuse me, Ukrainian government and uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure. Um, and from a cyber criminal standpoint, we're actually seeing a, an uptick in cyber criminal activity across a few notable sectors. One is uh, critical infrastructure, um, both again, uh, domestically here in the United States, that's where I'm presenting from, as well as in Europe. In addition to that, we're also seeing on, on government and state entities, so separate from critical infrastructure, but still associated with state government, as well as the financial sector across both you know, North American and Europe. And, and this is really Really just you know the hot off the press information from the last couple of weeks. Uh, as we have more information to share, we will definitely you know use forums like this in order to share that with you. Anything that you want to add there, Devere? Absolutely. Uh, I think that um, crime groups are trying to target whichever. It's basically open season. They're trying to target organizations based on their revenues, based on their si sizes, and uh, they can even go to Crunchbase to look for potential. Uh, large organizations with high revenues as potential targets. It's simple as that. When it comes to state-sponsored, it's a bit trickier. Uh, as we mentioned, every, every group has their own set of objectives. And sometimes in order to attack a specific country, 
they need to target a specific business which is large enough inside in within that uh, country in order to create a massive impact it could be targeting a large retailer or targeting uh, um, a large financial uh, organization within a specific country in order to topple the the stock the stock exchange and whatnot so uh, criminal organizations are going for everything they could grab uh, with their own set of uh, objectives such as looking for uh, financial organizations healthcare and whatnot while state sponsored are much more selective uh, at, at that, that approach. Thanks. And um, I'm just going to give a couple more minutes to see if anyone else uh, wants to, um, you know, uh, submit some questions, anything else that they want to share in order to uh, see if there's anything else that we want to cover. Uh, again, we are monitoring both the chat. I'm going to scroll through the chat again right now, as well as the Q&A to see if there's anything else uh, that we want to cover and answer on today's webinar. Interesting question on whether or not to uh, install Russian keyboards on endpoints, right? I, I think it's interesting mm -hmm. that uh, some of the attacks are key to, to look and avoid for those, right? Or exactly. Avoid those kind of keyboards. Yeah, so some of the pieces of malware being used by threat actors and criminal organizations worldwide is not to attack uh, potential CIS countries. And uh, it's very important because they are doing all sorts of language detection, such as Russian, Ukrainian, Georgian, and, and et cetera. There's a long list for that. Um, I think these days are over. I think that right now um, with, with the state of everything going on, um, threat actors are targeting as many organizations as possible. And if someone from these countries is actually being affected, they usually go to the um, victim support type of website and ask for a free decryption, free decryptor because we're from the country. How did you impact us? And they usually provide them a free crypto on that specific in instance. So uh, I think they shifted from that approach and it's not a valid solution today. Uh, I got one that I want to cover that actually came in through the chat, which is, is Dandler being updated for correlated activities such as the things that we covered today? Um, yes, actually, that, that's an ongoing process at Verona. So um, I'll, I'll cover my role as well as how we then transition that to our research team. So we both have DeVere's team, the, the security research and threat labs team at Verona, who combs through open source as well as closed source intelligence feeds in order to ensure that the threat models or the detection logic in Verona can identify the threats that are relevant today. Uh, and that's just an ongoing research and development effort at Veronis. In addition to that, my team, the, the customer facing incident response team, when we see an, an incident or an investigation, we're pulling out samples and indicators that we're then feeding to the research team. And we use mechanisms that are built into Veronis, specifically called our live update mechanism to actually be able to update threat models and detection logic so that that goes right back into our clients when we identify something that potentially no one had identified before. So yes, we are actually always updating things in not just today, but every day uh, with both what we see in the field and what we're discovering from a research standpoint. Now, um, another one that came in, uh, and Devere, uh, I'm not sure if you've got uh, anything to add here, but one of our audience members wants to know if you have any social media that they can follow you on. So I'm active on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and I have my own repository on GitHub, uh, trying to publish all sorts of uh, POCs or just uh, defensive tools. While we write and release our own blog posts uh, continuously and we publish them on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Would, would you mind dropping your Twitter handle in the chat for uh, for anyone in the audience? Yes, absolutely. Matt, this isn't an OSINT exercise, right? No, I, I mean, they, look, I mean, it might be, right? But I think it's safe if, if DeVere's you know, uh, Twitter profile is public for us to drop that in there. Um, now, um, the, the only other thing I think, uh, that I want to cover that that's come in so far, um, is does Veronis offer AI defense solutions? So, um, 
not the focus of today's webinar is, is Vronis and, and really everything that, that the, our data security platform does. If you want to find out more about it, um, you can either hit us up in the chat. If you didn't click yes during the poll, that's one way to do it. But just to keep it really brief, um, we do offer behavioral based uh, threat detection and response solution, as well as uh, software that can help you protect your data, both on prem and in the cloud. And we have a great uh, team of people that help you achieve that mission. And if you want to find out more, you can just drop us a message in the chat, message our, our hosts, our panelists, and and we'd be glad to give you a briefing as a follow-up to today. Uh, and with that, I, I just wanted to just give a shout out to all of our audience members. Um, thank, thank you for coming today, as well as all of our co-presenters. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Devere, as well as the marketing team for helping us put this on today. Um, and I look forward to connecting with you guys again.